Hi, I'm Michael O'Hare, ex-CEO, philanthropist, all-round life coach, and the author and founder of the worldwide acclaimed Best in Business Seminar Series. Welcome to Enter the Dojo of Business, Hiya, where I will be taking live Q&A business questions from you, members of the public who want to be better, no, the best in business. Welcome. Now, my first email this evening is from a Michaela Allison from Phillipsburg in Idaho. Thank you, Michaela. She says, any tips for dealing with poor performers in the workplace? That's a great question, Michaela. There are two main schools of thought. The first is the usual style. You belittle them. You laugh at their suggestions. You tell them how crap they are. You maybe even call them Susan. Or there's the old school technique developed by the renowned management and business academic Magnus Magnuson. And in his Magnus Opus on management in the workplace, he said to understand the poor performer, you had to become the poor performer. You have to become that which you despise. So what does that mean in practice? Well, it means identifying the types of people who would be poor performers and looking at their attributes. They don't look after themselves. They're disheveled, maybe a bit overweight. They have bad handwriting, stubby fingers. They're whistlers, ear pickers, ponderers, and twitchers. Those are the types of poor performer attributes that you need to hone in on. Now, Michael, will this result in bad news for me? Well, in the short term, yes, you will have no bonus because you yourself will have become a poor performer. Indeed, in some circumstances, people have been known to be fired. But what's more important, I ask you, the short term benefit of putting somebody down or the longer term benefit of knowing and being a better man manager? Thanks, Michaela from Phillipsburg. Uh, we now have our next question, and that is uh, no name here. It says, uh, will growing facial hair give me more gravitas in the boardroom? Um, I say no name there, but it has been scientifically proven by the Harvard Business School researchers that people love hair on a face. But there are very, very strict rules around it. The first I would like to tackle is the monobrow. The monobrow is only acceptable as facial hair in the Middle East and Southwest Asia. Indeed, in these regions, it is the de facto way of getting a promotion. However, the two main universal forms of facial hair are indeed the moustache and the beard. The moustache um, has to be grown, again, very strict rules around it. It has to be grown in a way that it delivers a kind of a certain je ne sais quoi about it. Indeed, some types of moustache are perhaps unacceptable. For example, the Charlie Chaplin moustache. Now, again, quite funny around about that time, but since 1945, it has been given a sort of an air of excessive dictatorial datorship about it. I don't know what that word means, um, but you get what I'm talking about. The other moustache is the pencil thin moustache. Again, very old school, and indeed in certain circumstances can be seen as very wise and very knowledgeable. Unfortunately, most people with a pencil moustache tend to stray into sexual harassment territory. No, the moustache that I would advise taking on is indeed the moustache that I indeed wear. It's fulsome. It says this person has an air of authority. They're knowledgeable. They will tend to be firm but fair. And they mix business with pleasure. The beard, on the other hand, has been around since the time of Jesus. Of course, Jesus was the ultimate people manager, um, although he never actually managed a balance sheet of $50 billion for an asset management company. But that aside, Jesus was the archetypal beard-wearing preacher. Um, as you can see in the picture, it's well-groomed, it's straightened, it's been oiled. There is nothing worse than having a beard that resembles perhaps a despot leader, a dirty hobo, or indeed a mad befuddled wizard, or a tweed-wearing geography teacher. So, Yes, moustache, beard, 
very acceptable, but there are very, very strict rules around it. So say, oh, there's no name there. Oh, no, there is a name. Will it give me more gravitas in the boardroom from Dorothy McGuigan? Good Lord. Right. Ah, I've got a question in from an Andrew Heron. Hi, Mr. O'Hare. Hello, Andrew. How does one relax after a hard day in the office? That is a very great question. Well, I tend to just put on the TV, watch some featherweight boxing, and I usually get a, if I'm very lucky, get a foot massage from my loyal Singaporean executive assistant, John. Now, he is very good and will, if needs be, uh, put extra services in too. I'm not talking about, um, anyway, anyway. Uh, that's what I do after work, and might even dabble with a bit of wine and cheese. I'm a bit of an enthusiast there. So, thanks for your question, Andrew. That's what I do. Okay, next question that came through on the email. It is from, oh, it's an anonymous one. It says, hi, Michael. If you discovered that a member of your staff was a convicted pedophile, would you give him a second chance? Asking for a friend. Would I give him a second chance? Well, I'm assuming here that you're not referring to a second chance with another child. You are, in fact, referring to a second chance in the workplace. In either circumstances, my answer is no. So thank you, Anonymous. Uh, I have uh, an email in from, ah, Michael. How does one perform the perfect business handshake? Can you learn a lot about a potential client or business part partner by the way they shake hands? Yes, MC, you can learn a lot. Um, the, the most important thing about a handshake is you are telling that other person, hey, Buster, I'm in charge. So your firm your handshake has to be very firm. It has to grip, and it has to look them in the eye when you're doing it. Uh, the number of times I have shaken hands with people with damp, wet fish, warm hands, um, I can't tell you. I'd, have a, I'd be a billionaire if I had a dime for every time that that happened. So yes, a firm handshake, I stare, and don't let go. Don't let go. Thank you, MC. Uh, next one is an email from Paul Wiseman. Hi, Michael. I am based in London and recently received an amazing resume in for a position we are hiring for. Uh, the academic credentials are excellent, the work experience is exactly what we need, and the references supplied have all said that this individual is a great person to work with. Great. However, I speak the Queen's English, and I have just found out that this person has a regional accent. Should I hire them? That is a superb question. Now, let's be very straight. Finance, banking, advisory, management consultancy, you want to have somebody with a US East Coast or West Coast or indeed a London accent. It's trustworthy. It's impactful. It's influential. It's the true dialect of business. But of course, there are other business models um, where regional actions will indeed work. So you need to decide that, Paul. Um, clients, in fact, will find regional actions quite entertaining, <laughs> funny, or indeed sometimes just show sympathy. Um, examples may include, and I've got some here, uh, the West Country of England. Or I'm a wholesale supplier and distributor to pirates. Or it might be from Alabama. Yeah, I want to buy some pigs. Or it might be South African. You're going to buy this at my price or I'm going to take you outside and shoot you. Or it might be from a call center in Bangalore, India. No, that's my attorney saying no, no, no. Well, well, in any case, I hope that helps you, Paul, make your decision. Depends on your business model. Uh, Ah, great question in just through the live text feed. Um, tie or no tie? Great question. Very simple answer, tie. In all occasions, bar none. Uh, my, we're running, we've got a few more minutes left. We've got a Facebook message in from a Ms. Johnson in Scotland. Uh, she's a big fan of Best in Business. Hi, Michael. I'm keen to address some crucial team building etiquette tonight. For example, 
Is it acceptable to blame a work colleague for a major error you have made? She says, I have no issue with this myself, and I find it an effective way to avoid being replaced when there is an office or company restructuring and people are made redundant. Your thoughts, please. Yes, Miss Johnson, it is wholly acceptable to blame others for your major mistake. It's classic 101 management consultancy mantra. Take accountability when there's success. Give accountability when there's failure. You should always blame others for the mistakes you make. Why? Because you're thinking about them. You're giving them an opportunity. You're being inclusive. You need to give somebody else an opportunity to shoulder the blame, right? Build on their career and learn from mistakes. Now, I have a great example of this. I was, about 15 years ago, I was in a very, very busy elevator and I accidentally touched a female co-worker's breast. I immediately blamed the junior analyst standing next to me and he was fired immediately. But I was thinking about him. I was being inclusive. He was able to use that information and build on it in his competency questions at his next job interview. And now he is the area manager at Walmart in St. George, Utah. So thanks very much for your question, Ms. Johnson. I support it entirely. Uh, we have a question in from a LinkedIn message from Jolene Hole in Wisconsin. Hole, spelt H-O-L-E. Uh, she says, my boss permanently has a bogey or a booger hanging from his nose. I've tried to work out if it was just a rogue nasal hair, but after many hours of staring at his face, I've reached the conclusion it is in fact dried mucus. Should I tell him? Oh, Jolene, 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 Jolene! Very, very naive. Of course not. It is a deliberate, old-school management technique to distract clients or colleagues. The psychology behind it is essentially you notice it, you're distracted by it, and you will agree to anything just to get yourself out of that very awkward situation and you can move on. So what I would say to you, Jolene, is target that booger. Embrace it. Don't be distracted by it and stand by your argument. Thank you, Jolene. Uh, I have an email from Mbele Mbele in Nairobi. Michael, I love you best in business. You could make an effort on the grammar checker. However, I want to know, can I use my work phone for personal calls? Very quick question, uh, very, very quick answer to that one. Um, if you are a senior management executive with your own office, secretary, coat stand, mahogany desk, coffee maker, leather chair, then of course you can. It's part of your extensive executive management benefits. Go right ahead. But I'm getting a sense in belly from your email that because it was quite an ignorant question that you're not quite executive management. So you sound quite junior, if I'm being honest. And so I would say, just get back to work. Hell no, you should be working for that promotion, not whinging about it. Okay, we are, what one more question today. One more question. Um, and this is a Twitter message, message from at titsmeanbiz. I don't even know how that works, but I have checked out your Twitter profile and I definitely understand the first syllable of that username. Um, tits, uh, she said, or he says, uh, hey, Michael, my boss has set my sales targets too high. What can I do? Well, here's a good thing. Embrace it for the love of God. Just get on with it. You should revel in the opportunity to make more income and increase profitability. So I would say man up, stop being a pussy. Um, but, but, but please do just keep posting those pictures on your Twitter feed. Anyway, that is about it for this evening. Thank you very much for joining me for my live Q&A session. Enter the dojo of business. Hiya! And hopefully next week, you can join me again for another live Q&A session with me, Michael O'Hare, the very best in business.